So, I've been a Star Wars fan for almost as long as I can remember. I was around 11 years old when I first watched Episode 4 on VHS. Ha, ah, good old potato resolution. Having to squint your eyes to see anything. Seeing the adventures of a young, inexperienced farm boy and his initial trepidations about finding his place in the vastness of the galaxy, I guess gave me hope that I too could gain the confidence I needed to tackle the challenges that I faced and would face getting older. Of course, I failed miserably. But hey, at least I had hope. Rebellions are built on hope. I think when it comes to stories like these, stories that most of us cherish and remember fondly, one of the most crucial ingredients needed to make them succeed is being able to sort of manipulate the viewer into placing themselves and their own ego into the main character of the story. Because we want to feel like we're important and that our lives have some kind of meaning. Just look at the behavior and actions of pretty much anyone you can see, famous or otherwise, and you'll probably see someone who is either trying to do good things in the world or those who want to believe they're doing good things but are actually just driving people batshit insane. Is that like a personal attack or something? Or you... I don't know! Stop bothering me! I think it's fundamental to our very nature to believe that we are, or should be, bringing some kind of purpose to our lives and maybe the world too, whether we're conscious of that or not. I think that's why, when we see a fictional character like Luke Skywalker, who spent three movies transitioning from a dumb, inexperienced farm boy to a fully-fledged Jedi Knight with a more fully realized sense of self, leadership, and maturity, overcoming weaknesses and challenges through time, determination, and sheer strength of will, we tend to empathize and connect with him on a deep emotional level. He's fighting for something he believes in, even when it's hard and even when he wants to give up. When we see characters suffering great losses, dealing with hardships, and generally just getting kicked in the ass by life's unyieldingly persistent setbacks, it's far more compelling to watch, as opposed to characters that just triumph over every single problem they face. It's not realistic to expect to be handed success without any effort put forth in earning it. Luke is allowed to fail in the original trilogy. He's allowed to be weak. He's forced to rely on his friends and in the wisdom of his much more experienced mentor figure. And thankfully, as a result, the Empire is allowed to feel like an actual threat, being treated as galactic rulers that are actually capable of maintaining that level of control. True also is the way that this improves the plight of the Rebellion, because now the threat that they face also feels more real and more urgent, and we are allowed to empathize with their struggle as well as the heroes. But none of this is even possible when you have a Mary Sue character that can just float through the script and do whatever they want. It upsets the balance. The entire rest of the characters and world must bend over backwards to make sure they don't get so much as a bruised knee. Luke lost his freaking hand right after learning his own dad is one of the most evil men in the whole galaxy. What did Ray lose? Couple hours off her Wednesday afternoon? I think this is why, even to this day, I am just utterly bewildered that the sequel trilogy turned out as mind-shreddingly awful as it did. I mean, when I think of the writing in the sequel trilogy and all its myriad problems, I can't help but also think, this should not have been this hard. I mean, think about it. They had basically all the money, access to the original creator of the franchise, who offered his services as consultant for free, and who apparently wants to completely redo the sequels now. <laughs> Uh, can't blame you there, George. They had a giant collection of ideas and source material called the Expanded Universe, which they then said no to, decanonized, and turned into legends, and then just completely denied its existence when actually having good ideas to draw from became inconvenient. Dick move, guys. Dick move. So, given all the things they did have access to, shouldn't this have been a lot easier for them to get right? Obviously, great writing is difficult to achieve. You have to be meticulous. You have to have an exceptional understanding of the strengths and limitations of the world and all of your characters. But add to that, for Star Wars, you have to be willing to write stories that don't interfere in a negative way with the existing movies, TV shows, books, etc. Basically, you have to understand and appreciate the Star Wars lore, and you have to be creative enough to be able to come up with interesting ideas within that pre-existing framework. It's not exactly for the faint of heart, but it's also not hard. That is to say, it shouldn't have been hard for Disney slash Lucasfilm to find the right people, 
or at least to find considerably better people than who they chose. I mean, for example, I think most Star Wars fans would agree that Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau are doing a much better job on The Mandalorian than J.J. and Ryan did on the sequel trilogy. Now, I have my issues with The Mandalorian, but it's a damn sight better than all three sequel movies. Even if they do appear to be now connecting the two with vacuum-sealed pickle jars full of Snoke's relatives. I made Snoke. So, the sequels, though, starting with Episode 7. J.J. didn't even want the job. Big red flag right there, regardless of how you feel about his mystery box style approach. What's in the box? <sighs> nothing! Absolutely nothing! Stupid! You're so stupid! You need to pick someone who cares. Someone who says hell yes and leaps at the opportunity to work on Star Wars. That's the kind of person you need to find. Take Marvel. Marvel owes its success to the Russo brothers. These guys clearly care about the stories they write within the framework of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They knew their characters, they developed them well, they had great setups and payoffs, and in the end, game, they shattered all the records. It's not a mistake to seriously consider people for the job who give a shit about your franchise. But anyway, I think at this point in the game, Lucasfilm thought they could do no wrong. TFA dropped, and it was shattering records, kind of, and Kathleen Kennedy was like, All right! And then for episode 8, she hired Ryan Johnson, the writing equivalent of that guy in the back alleyway who offers discount vasectomies but charges you less than a real doctor would, and doesn't need insurance, and I'll never be the same again, Jeremy, you bastard-ass son of a bitch! So she brought on Ryan Johnson, who intentionally makes divisive movies, just just for the sake of, like, personal satisfaction. I would be worried if everybody across the board was like, yeah, that was a good movie. It's much more exciting to me when you get, you know, um, a group of people who are, like, coming up to you and, and really, really excited about it, and you know it's going to be something that they're having their DVD collection watch over, and you know, the way that I got into, like, you know, Miller's Crossing, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, it, and then there are other people who walk out just, I mean, literally saying that was the worst movie I've ever seen. Having those two extremes to me is, you know, is the mark of uh, the type of movie that I want to make, so. <sighs> I could bitch for volumes. Just a whole library filled with angry novels with terrible prose, horrible sentence structure, scribble marks all over the place, and chock full of F-words. So this guy was chosen to carry the baton in the middle of the sequel trilogy relay race in the middle of an established universe with several other movies for reference that he probably didn't even watch, let alone analyzed or understood in a way that he could make sure his writing didn't fuck up things like continuity or characters. You know, that's a bit like taking the Lord of the Rings trilogy and having Quentin Tarantino direct The Two Towers. That would have been a hell of a curveball. How do you think that would have panned out? It probably would have had a lot more Hobbit feet. Ugh. Yep, The Last Jedi, the second movie in the trilogy, the sequel to the already somewhat questionable at this point, Force Awakens, is of course pretty much where all hope became lost for a significant portion of the Star Wars fan base. <laughs> But my only point in even mentioning this guy and his awful movie is to highlight the fact that he gave, like, negative 9,001 fucks about the franchise. It's over 9,000! Like, he was in fuck debt. He had no fucks to give. And Kathleen Kennedy may have come in with her forces female gender politics agenda, but Ryan came in with an agenda all his own. Be divisive and subvert everyone's expectations without any substantive reasons whatsoever. And then, when that whole mess became a bigger mess, for the next movie, they went with J.J. Again! Imagine how little J.J. must have cared the second time around. But whatever. Summed up, pick people who want the damn job. That's reason number one in my book of why this should have been easier for Disney Lucasfilm. Reason number two. I like to call this one, WHO QC'D THIS? Ah yes, good old quality control. That's a concept I've not seen in a long time. It's the utmost paramount of hubris and arrogance to assume that you don't need anyone else's input on a creative endeavor, especially on something so massive. Especially on a $4 billion franchise. Especially when it means you screwing up this badly. 
I mean, even the master himself, George Lucas, needed people on the ground level with him to look at his ideas and tell him when something wasn't going to work out. A New Hope was basically completely saved on the cutting room floor because George's original version was really overly long and drawn out. But he had people near him who could help him with the editing process. They came in and removed all the unnecessary bits and bobs that meandered around for way too long. They tightened things up and made things much more succinct. The end result was a much smoother, more organized edit that created much more tension and drama as you watch it. And that is the cut of A New Hope as we know it today. But if Lucas had denied any outside help, if he had said no to people who were genuinely just trying to help make the product better, then Star Wars would most likely have died right then and there. I mean, it would not have gone on to be a household term, and it probably would not have altered the course of movie history for the better like it did. Lucas was excellent at world building. He was excellent at building up all the different pieces of technology and ships and weaponry used in Star Wars. He could tell you how a TIE fighter worked. He could tell you how a droidica worked. He probably rolled his eyes when he saw lasers falling in space like freaking baseballs in a baseball field. But he, well, he kind of sucked complete ass at character dialogue. I don't like sand. I mean, strengths and weaknesses, you know? The man is brilliant in his own right, but that doesn't mean he's not human. And nobody's perfect at any one thing. So to head into such a massive undertaking with the idea that Star Wars is just Star Wars, it's a cash cow, and it can't fail because it's amazing and everyone will just love it no matter what or whatever, not only will you fail harder than you can possibly imagine, but it's just an absolute slap in the face to those who came before, the ones who put in the time, hard work, and tender care into their own creative vision. And as a rule of thumb, it's not usually a good idea to completely snub the creator of your franchise. Hello, JJ, just dropping this off. Hey, George, uh, what, uh, what are you doing here? Look, I'm not here to look over anyone's shoulder. Disney said they'd look over my story treatments, so uh, there's a lot of great stuff in here that I think you'll- Ah, wonderful. Let me just scan these into our file server for safekeeping. What the- Hey! That's- that's a shredder! JJ! No, it isn't. So, that's basically it. That's my little tiddly bits. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I honestly think all the problems with the sequel trilogy can be boiled down to a fundamental lack of understanding about the kind of story Star Wars really is, and having way too much hubris and arrogance to tackle this thing with enough skill, talent, and respect for the source material and its characters. I mean, seriously, just what they did to Luke alone is a masterclass in what not to do. Ever. 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 At the end of the day, the sequel trilogy will go down in history as feeling like really expensive fan films made by people who don't even care as much as people who make fan films, made instead only by the almighty dollar and corporate greed. I mean, it says right in the script, forget the past, kill it if you have to. <laughs> You're doing a pretty good job. I'm trying. Uh <laughs>